Hello, this video is for STAT 310 Fall 2021 and will cover Handout 3 Part B, where we cover additional examples of the matched paired t-test. Okay, let's go ahead and get started then. So the first example that we're going to be looking at here has to do with the vitamin intake study. And this study was actually done here at Winona State's campus. What we have is the actual caloric intake of a bunch of Winona State students. And then we also have the DRI measurement for each of those students as well. The DRI measurement is the daily recommended intake. The goal here is to figure out or to determine whether or not WSU students are taking in, on average, an appropriate amount of calories. We also have this information on vitamin A, vitamin C, calcium, iron, etc. But for this analysis, we're only going to be looking at calories. So here's what that data set looks like inside of Jump. And what I'm going to do here is to insert a column here. And I'm going to compute the difference between calories actual and calories DRI. So my difference column is going to be computed as follows here. Pull this onto the screen so you can see it. It's going to be calories actual minus calories DRI. And my analysis will be done on this difference column like we've talked about in part B, a part A of this handout. So I'm going to select analyze distribution, the differences here, and my analysis is going to be based on, oops, flip that to horizontal. There we go. Here's what those differences look like. On average, I'm about 350. Okay, off. So this is, again, the difference between actual calories and DRI. So if this value is negative, which it tends to be here with an average of negative 350 or so, what that means is that the actual caloric intake is less than the daily recommended caloric intake. So for this person right here, you can see that it's negative. Here's a bunch of negatives here listed. So for all of these people, the actual caloric intake is less than the daily recommended intake. And the summaries from our jump output here is saying that that's about 350 off. They are about 350 below their daily recommended intake. Okay. So again, we have the standard summaries here on the top of uh, page 17. We have the dot plot. From the dot plot, we can see that many of the points are less than zero here. So it does appear that Winona State students are not taking in enough calories compared against their daily recommended intake. We can run an analysis or a test on that. So before doing that, we might want to check the normality assumption. Again, we're using our normal quantile plot that looks okay. The data is pretty symmetric, so the standard test should work quite well. Again, the research question, is there a difference on average? So we're des definitely testing the average here and the amount of caloric intake relative to their daily recommended. Here's the null and alternative in words, and then we put that into symbols here, just testing the average difference. Inside of jump here, to get our test, we just, from our drop-down menu, are going to say test mean. And then we are going to leave this at zero, just testing no difference. Go ahead and hit OK. And that's going to bring my testing output. We are actually running a two-sided test, so the inequality in HA is not equal to. So we're going to want to select the top p-value here the less than 0 0.0001. Again, the distribution, the reference distribution that Jump provides here is centered about the no difference scenario. This red line is at the negative 346, and we can see definitely that that's an outlier, so we can be certain that P 
people are taking in a different amount of calories than their daily recommended intake. So the p-value here is this one highlighted there on the screen, less than 0 0.0001. That does provide enough evidence for the research question. And then the decision here, go ahead and maybe highlight that for you, or the conclusion or final statement, excuse me. The decision is that we have enough evidence to reject the H naught. The conclusion is that we are 95% certain that there is a difference on average in the amount of caloric intake for WSU students. The p-value there is provided as well with that statement. The 95% confidence interval is provided under my summary statistic output. So we can see that that's about negative 230 to negative 450 or so. And that's just going to be how much on average the caloric intake is off from the daily recommended intake. So again, as I've talked about, the test is very binary. It's either do I have enough evidence to say that they're off of target or not? And the decision was that they do indeed, or they are indeed off of target. There is a difference on average. Okay, not just for these 70 so people in the study, but in general, I can say that one Ona State students are gonna be under eating excuse me, are going to be off of their target. That's what I get from the test. The interval tells you how much they're off, and it tells me that it's completely negative, which means they're going to be under eating. So I can be 95% certain here that WSU students are actually off by 230 up to 460 calories. The margin of error here is just the distance. So the margin of error calculation is on the right here. That's just the distance from the middle up to the upper end or to the lower end. And that would be given by the 1.99 times the 57.72. 57.72 is the standard error for the mean here. And that standard error for the mean is simply the amount of variation in this distribution of differences or average differences over the repeated sampling. So standard error mean here is the amount of standard deviation in this reference distribution, which here we're using the average difference over repeated sampling. So we would take that and just basically multiply it by two, roughly, the exact value of obtained from a T distribution, and that's here on the screen. Okay, let's go ahead and do... Um, Oh, a little bit about the one-sided intervals here. So if I were to do a one-sided test, if I wanted to know that they were indeed under eating, I would have to select the one-sided p-value. So that's going to be this one here. This would be the one-sided left p-value. The corresponding confidence interval would be just a one-sided confidence interval. And I can get those inside of the JMP package Again, what I would do is just from my drop-down menu, say confidence interval here, other, and then I can specify that I want actually a one-sided interval or lower limit or one-sided upper limit here. Now it turns out if I'm doing a left-sided test, so I want to know whether or not they're under eating, what I'm actually interested in is not the lower endpoint of the confidence interval, but the upper endpoint, because I want to make sure that this upper endpoint stays below zero. So if I'm doing a one-sided left test, what I actually do for my interval is obtain the upper endpoint. So the interpretation of this 250 is that I can be certain that WSU students are eating at least 250 calories below their daily recommended intake. Typically, in practice, we don't do one-sided intervals very often. And as a result, one-sided testing is also less common than two-sided. In this particular situation, I think the one-sided confidence, uh, excuse me, the one-sided test, the one-sided research question is actually more appropriate because then I can establish whether or not they're not eating enough, which I think is more informative than just saying, are they off of target? All right, let's look at a second example now. 
So in this particular example, this is the ear infection example. And what they did is they took pairs of babies and they matched them up according to their age, their gender, their socioeconomic status, and the types of medications taken. So this first pair of babies were matched again. So maybe they were both maybe nine months old. They were both boys. They were both from middle-income families. And the type of medications taken, maybe there was none. One of those babies was breastfed and the other bo uh, was bottle-fed. And I just want to know whether or not breastfeeding has a reduction or a difference. Does it have an impact or is there an effect of breastfeeding when looking at the duration of ear infection. So the numbers here are actually the number of days. These observations are definitely paired up. You can see that I have 24 different pairs. So maybe these, the pair number two, maybe those are three month old babies and maybe they're girls. So that would constitute another pair. First thing I'm gonna do is compute the differences. And again, when I do that, I notice that I have some extreme outliers here. So what's unique about this particular example is those extreme outliers. So let's go ahead and just look at how I can deal with those inside of the JMP package. So first thing I'm going to do again is compute those differences. And I'm going to take breastfed minus bottle fed here. I can do a analyze distribution on these. And what I'm going to see again here, display options horizontal, I'm going to see those extreme observations there. So what that means, this is negative 26 here. So let's interpret the average here. So the difference here actually represents days. All right, so this is a positive difference. This means that the bottle fed baby actually did two days better than the breastfed baby. This is the duration of fluid in their inner ear. So a smaller number is better. This means they had fluid in their inner ear 18 days. The breastfed baby had fluid in, its inner, in his inner ear 20 days. So a positive value means that bottle fed is doing better. Here's a negative value. I do have some very extreme negative values. So pair number four, you can see that they're off by 158 days. So that's a very extreme observation observation. That's one of these three in here. So if we leave those outliers in there, what I would be saying is that the breastfed babies are doing better by a total of 26 days, which this is ear infection. So that's almost a month. Those three observations are having a huge impact on that average. So I'm probably going to want to consider taking those out. Furthermore, if I look at a normal quantile plot, I'm going to see that these three observations right here are really messing up their normality assumption. Which again, you might want to advocate taking those observations out. So I can do that inside of the JMP package by just doing a right click and say exclude. Puts a little Ghostbuster circle there right on those observations. There's three of them that I need to find here. And then this one down here. So those are those three outliers. And now I can go back to my output here. So here is my output. And I'm going to, from the drop down, just say uh, from the top drop down there, sorry, I'm going to say redo, redo analysis. And what I should see is the number of observations go from 24 down to 21. Okay. And now you can see that the average now is not negative 26, but it's brought down to six days. So the average here is a little more reasonable. My observations are staying within the bands there. It does appear that I might have one more outlier here. We'll talk about that at the very end. It turns out that that extra outlier isn't really influencing things too much. Okay. So here we're just showing you taking out those three observations. Uh, I ended up computing or asking the JMP package to compute the standardized score or a Z-score for each of those, which is simply the data point minus the mean. 
I can get those. I should probably show you how I got those inside of the JMP package. So here is my outcomes again from all the data. I can, from my drop down menu, I can just say save and then I'm going to select standardized here and those will be those Z scores. That'll put those Z scores in the spreadsheet for me. Okay. And now what I'm looking for when I'm looking at those standardized differences or standardized scores is anything less than two. So those three outliers are definitely less than two there. The other outlier at negative 59 is actually not, according to the Z-score, is not that much of an outlier. However, when I take those out, the new data, you might end up, this Z-score is going to change, and then you might end up having more outliers after you take out these three. We usually don't iterate that process because that seems kind of weird. You just continually keep throwing data out. So here I'm going to leave that negative 57 in for now. And as I said, I'll show you at the end that it's not really going to matter. Here's the output based on 21 observations. You can see that the average is now negative six days. So on average, the breastfed babies are doing better by six days, which is much more reasonable than the minus 26. Same type of test. Nothing really changes here. Two-sided, again, very standard to run two-sided here. The data on the left here is the data that's based on all, or the output, excuse me, based on all the data. And again, I don't really feel comfortable test using that output because of those extreme outliers. If I take those three outliers out, here's the output that I get. One thing that I've added here is the signed rank values. Okay, so when I'm doing my test inside of Jump, I can ask for those signed rank tests. So if I go from my drop down, say test mean, I'm going to go ahead and test zero again, but I'm also going to ask for the signed rank, Wilcox and signed rank. This test here is a good test to use or should be used if you have some extreme observations. So it's a little bit more foolproof, I guess, when you have outliers. It's not perfect, but it does do a little bit better in the presence of outliers. The Wilcox and Signed Rank Test is not influenced as much as the standard t-test when you have outliers present in your data. The output here, okay, looks very similar. Maybe look at it here. These values are for the t-test here, and these values on the right are for the Signed Rank Test. Now this is a two-sided test. It's two-sided here. So I'm going to want to be picking the prob bigger than T, absolute T here. But I have choices here. I can use the 0 0.1029, which is what I might advocate because of the outliers, or at least that we still have that one extreme observation present. So it might be a good idea to use that Wilcox and signed rank test. Now I did say that that test isn't foolproof. Over here, when we had all the data in, the Wilcox and signed rank test was still adversely affected by those three extreme observations. Okay, so what is the p-value? The p-value here is 0 0.1029 is the one I would use. If you wanted to rely on the normal theory, you could use the 0 0.0671. Again, neither one of these are less than the 0 0.05, so I end up with the same conclusion, which is good, I guess. So I would report the p-value as 0 .0, uh, 0.01029, was it? Is what I would report that as. And then I would say, is that less than 0 0.05? It is not. So here we do not have enough evidence for the research question. The 95% confidence interval goes from about negative 13 up to about 0.5. So it actually catches zero. And when it catches zero, it just means that we cannot be certain that the breastfed babies are going to do better than the bottle-fed babies. And that's exactly what we learned up here with the test as well, is that I don't have enough evidence to say that there's a difference that exists between these two. This is not less than 0 0.05. You'd end up again, like I said, with the same conclusion if you use the standard t-test as well. Your p-value would just be somewhat closer to 0 0.05. So given that we know that we cannot establish a difference, it makes sense that the confidence interval would actually catch zero. 
just a little bit of that interval is above zero. What happens if I were to take out that one additional observation, so that observation that had a difference of negative 59? We can see here, it's a little hard to see on the screen, but I still end up with non-significant results. So the p-values do change a little bit. The p-value with the outlier in there was 0 0.1029, now it's 0 0.1781, but again, I'd end up with the same decision. So that additional observation there at negative 59 is really not adversely what I'm saying. Now, if I left the original observations in there, all three of those, I would say that I did have a statistical difference. But again, I don't think it's fair to let those three observations pull that average that far down and give me kind of a, maybe a, not a real good analysis here because that, or those three outliers are messing up my average so much. Okay, then that does it for handout three, part B. Thank you. Have a good day.